Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, your daily dive into the news. We have a lot to talk about today. So you just buckle up, you hit that like button, and let's jump into it. This is a new show. Jose Ibarra will be spending the rest of his life in prison for the murder of Lakin Riley. Because Riley was a 22-year-old nursing student at the University of Georgia, and back in February, she went out for a jog one morning. But after she didn't come back a few hours later, and because she wasn't answering her phone, her roommate called campus police, who then found her body at a park on campus with reports saying she had been brutally beaten, with the coroner later confirming she had died from blunt force trauma and asphyxiation. And with that, the following day, the police arrested Jose Ibarra, with them noting that he had multiple scratches along his arms. With then in May, a grand jury indicting him on 10 different crimes, three felony murder charges, malice murder, kidnapping, aggravated assault with intent to rape, aggravated battery, tampering with evidence, peeping Tom, and hindering a 911 call. With police saying Ibarra didn't know Riley that this was an isolated incident and calling it a crime of opportunity. With an all of this pretty immediately setting off a political firestorm. Because this wasn't just a story of a man attacking a woman in the middle of the woods. Ibarra is also an undocumented immigrant from Venezuela. So immediately we saw conservatives latching onto this story and blaming the Biden administration. She was brutally murdered by one of the millions of illegal border crossers President Biden chose to release into our homeland. Y'all, as a mom, I can't quit thinking about this. I mean, this could have been my daughter. This could have been yours. And back in March, we saw Marjorie Taylor Greene shouting Lake and Riley during Biden's State of the Union, prompting this moment. Not really. I. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of the thousands of people being killed by illegals? You also saw Riley's killing becoming a rallying cry for Trump's re-election campaign with him and some other Republicans claiming that undocumented immigrants are fueling violent crime in the country. Though with that, you had a number of people trying to counter that with a number of reports, including a recent one from the National Institutes of Justice, which found lower crime rates across the board for undocumented immigrants compared to legal citizens. But this crime, it horrified people. It even spurred the Lake and Riley Act, which would require federal officials to arrest and detain undocumented immigrants accused of some crimes until they're deported. And while that bill easily cleared the House with bipartisan support back in March, it still hasn't been voted on in the Senate. Though separate from the political firestorm, Ray, Ibarra's immigration status really hasn't been a factor in the trial itself. Instead, you know, the focus was on him being a murderer, with Riley's stepfather tearfully struggling to read through one of her journal entries that, of course, now will never come true. To my future husband, I want you to know that I'm thinking about you. I'm working every day to become the best wife I can be by working through my current relationships to best prepare me for ours and our kids one day. We can't wait to love you in the best way I know how for the rest of our lives. <laughs> You also had prosecutors describing Ibarra as a predator who went hunting for females at the university, and special prosecutor Sheila Ross specifically saying, when Lake and Riley refused to be his rape victim, he bashed her skull in with a rock repeatedly, and then presenting evidence, including the discovery of Ibarra's DNA under Riley's fingernails and his thumbprint on her phone screen, with them also describing surveillance footage purportedly showing Ibarra attempting to dispose of evidence after the killing. And then on top of that, a number of local and federal law enforcement witnesses provided detailed accounts placing Ibarra at the scene, mainly through cell phone data and GPS data from Riley's smartwatch. Now with this, the defense argued that while the evidence was graphic and disturbing, it didn't prove Ibarra's guilt, also claiming there was no evidence that Ibarra intended to rape her. But in the end, after everything played out, after Ibarra previously waived his right to a jury, Judge H. Patrick Haggard found him guilty on all charges. And then with that, he has been sentenced to life in prison without possibility of parole, which is actually exactly what prosecutors had asked for with him declining to seek the death penalty. And among those celebrating the decision, you had Donald Trump who wrote, the illegal who killed our beloved Lakin Riley was just found guilty on all counts for his horrific crimes. And adding, it is time to secure our border and remove these criminals and thugs from our country so nothing like this can happen again. Right, and this notably as, for example, this week, we had him confirming that he intended to declare a national emergency and use the military for mass deportations. But ultimately, that is where we are here. And of course, I'd love to know your thoughts, really, whether it be about either level of this story. Because at one level, of course, you have everything political about the situation, and the other, you just have a murderer being held accountable for the murder of a young woman. But then, in huge automotive slash backlash news. Let's talk 
about Jaguar, or Jaguar, or in the most troubling of places, Jaguar. Tony left a pop on my Jaguar. But however you pronounce it, the reason Jaguar is in the news is because they changed their logo and they revamped their image and uh, apparently, Everyone fucking cares a lot about that. And actually, there are a few different parts that are facing backlash. So I'll start with the logo, right? Because they're pivoting away from the famous big cat known as the Leaper, and they're moving to a more minimal version of that image where the cat is sort of just the negative space of some horizontal lines. And then with that, they'll also be changing the font for the brand, which will now say Jaguar with a very spaced apart, simple lettering with the J, G, and U, very subtly the only uppercase letters in the name while the rest are lowercase. With the company saying, it is a powerful celebration of modernism, geometric form, symmetry, and simplicity, demonstrating the unexpected by seamlessly blending upper and lowercase characters in visual harmony. But then also, as places like CNN have pointed out, there may be another intent behind the capital letter, right? like how you might say it out loud if there's an emphasis on the G and U. Explaining, it's also a little less of the American Jaguar and a bit more of the traditional Jaguar, as it's said across the pond. And notably, th this whole rebrand, it's coming as the company's in the middle of transitioning to go electric by 2026. And actually, in this transition era, they have stopped selling cars in the British market and they're only selling one model stateside. Which then brings us to another point of backlash, because right, to, to I guess mark this new direction the company's taking, they put out this video promotion that shows a bunch of models with very blank expressions wearing bright and wacky clothes against clashing bright backgrounds. They're very futuristic and Tilda Swinton-esque looking. You also got catchphrases flashing and synthy music that sounds kind of like a heartbeat and an ultrasound playing. All while notably not a car in sight. So one, people were like, what about the fucking cars? And two, it also sparked some kind of like anti-woke backlash because of the diversity of the models in the ad. Others also just generally not understanding the rebrand and video in general with the likes of Marquez Brownlee, for example, writing, this is horrible. It's also the most anybody has talked about Jaguar in 50 years. And it really makes me wonder how fast I could drive one of their cars in a school zone. Fine, I'll be honest, he didn't say the last part, but you did have others adding, this will be taught in schools is how not to do a rebrand. And tons of people thinking it's ironic that Jaguar's using the phrase copy nothing as it boasts this rebrand, considering it's roughly the one millionth company to switch its logo to something modern and basic. And this is according to Fortune, Jaguar's chief creative officer even had to tell reporters that his team, quote, had not been sniffing the white stuff when coming up with this. And the outlet also saying of this rebrand, the problem is that to be effective, brand campaigns need to deliver on their promise with actual products that live up to the claims made. And for the moment, Jaguar has little to show for itself. Though with that, the company will be showcasing more of this rebrand at Miami Art Week in December. Though for now, it remains to be seen if an actual vehicle will be a part of this, or if it's just gonna be more of the stuff that people are not liking so far. But what I will say is that you cannot deny that there is a lot of attention on the brand right now, which is why you have some arguing this thing could have a payoff, saying things like, I have no idea what this is all about, but it's genius. Everyone is talking about Jaguar in a moment of time when they're not actually making cars. But as one marketing professor explained to the Associated Press, this whole thing just strikes the wrong tone for buyers because Jaguar is not using its heritage to sell. But the counter to that is it is not a good thing if you do not stick the landing, right? If they don't, it's just that more people know you're a clown. Show. But then, y'all, I don't know if this story is more weird, insane, or funny. The your personal take will likely be connected to your thoughts around Logan Paul. And that is because the BBC was investigating Logan's crypto wallet. Right, this investigation was part of a documentary titled Logan Paul, Bad Influence, which will actually air today. And this morning, the BBC published an article about the crypto allegations against Logan alongside its release. And while that article claimed the BBC had seen evidence suggesting that Logan promoted investments without revealing that he stood to benefit from them, the part that has actually now gotten the most attention is the BBC trying to contact Logan. Because as the BBC explained, for several months, Paul refused to talk to the BBC about our investigation. But then going on to say, then he appeared to relent, inviting us to interview him at his gym in Puerto Rico. So they send him a list of the allegations they wanted him to respond to. They travel to Puerto Rico so they could get the answers in person. They even brave a tropical storm to do so. But when they actually got there to sit down with Logan Paul, this is what happened. All right, all right, all right. How are you enjoying Puerto Rico? Uh, yeah, pretty good, man. I have to say, the, the real Logan Paul looks very different. Did you come all the way over here to ask about how I look? Is Logan coming? I'm right here, bud. You came all the way to Puerto Rico from England. This is your interview. What do you got? So as you can probably tell, that is not Logan Paul. That is a look-alike, and I use look-alike very loosely. Right? He kind of looks like an alternate reality Logan Paul 10 years from now, where like the suicide forest controversy actually stuck. But then even that is kind of a stretch. It's just an older guy in a wig. But you know, it's this well-known Logan Paul impersonator by the name of Rodney Peterson. And so obviously the journalists trying to do this interview, they're not tricked by this, and they say, let's, let's just get out of here. I'm not doing this. 
Yeah, Matt, no. But then the bit goes even further when you can hear presumably staged protesters chanting against the BBC. You came all the way to Puerto Rico for this interview. They With the BBC then writing in the article, we had flown all that way just to be trolled and then adding, minutes after abandoning the interview, we received a lawyer's letter on behalf of Paul warning us of the possible consequences if we published our findings. And so as far as the findings in the BBC's investigation, they touched on previous crypto controversies that the internet has long talked about with Logan, like uh, the Dink Doink controversy and CryptoZoo. And to further investigate Logan's alleged wrongdoings in the crypto sphere, they looked at a wallet they said publicly belonged to him, as well as an anonymous one that they said appears to have close connections to him. Right? And this because the anonymous wallet got funds from Logan's public wallet before trading. And the BBC found several meme coins that Logan had posted about prompting them to increase in value and enrich his wallet. And while the outlet said that it cannot be sure of his intentions, you have people saying it seems pretty clear that his posts affected the price of some of these coins. With, for example, one tech journalist adding, a big guy with a lot of influence, someone like Logan Paul buys a ton of crypto and tells their followers about it. They're going to buy it too. Now, so far, Logan hasn't posted about this whole thing publicly, and we're gonna have to wait to see what comes out in this documentary. And so in the meantime, I just gotta ask, what are your thoughts both in general, and do you find this more weird, <laughs> insane, or funny? But then taking a quick break from the news, you know, most people have experienced the same stressful feeling of being at the bottom of a mountain of debt, and the truth is, many of us will get deeper in debt during the holidays. But I'm not trying to pile on the stress here, right? Just the opposite. Because listen, if you find yourself making payments each month on your debt, and the balances are not going down, the sponsor of today's show, PDS Debt, they have solutions for you. And this applies to everyone with over $10,000 or more in eligible debt, and there's no minimum credit score required. Bad and fair credit accepted. Because PDS Debt strives to understand your specific scenario and can help provide alternative solutions for becoming debt-free. They have customized options for anyone struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, even medical bills. They provide a service to match you with debt solutions tailored to your financial situation. And the first step is with the free debt analysis that they're offering you right now. It only takes 30 seconds. You just head over to pdsdebt.com slash DeFranco. Stop waiting and start saving. Get your free debt analysis right now at pdsdebt.com slash DeFranco. Because nobody likes the stress of mounting debt and the pressure that comes with that. Surviving is not living. Regain control of your life and live for you, not your debt. And then Netflix right now is having some good news, bad news about that joke of a fight that was Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson. While I ended up accidentally sleeping through most of it, and most people's reaction was, that was fucking kind of sad and stupid, it broke a ton of records. With Netflix putting out a press release saying that it averaged an estimated 108 million live viewers globally and peaking at 65 million concurrent streams, which would make it the most streamed sporting event ever. And then on top of that, ESPN reported that the fight broke records and became one of the most heavily wagered fights in years. With a spokesperson for BetMGM saying that more bets were placed and more cash was wagered on that fight than any other boxing or MMA event in the company's seven year history. But that is where the good news ends. Because reportedly Netflix is now facing a lawsuit over the quality issues during the fight. Because you know, if you watched it at all or even just used social media while the fight was going on, you know that Netflix was crashing out for tons of people. Videos going viral of people getting every error code under the sun. So now you have TMZ reporting that a man by the name of Ronald Blue Denton has filed a class action suit in Florida because he struggled to watch the broadcast. And while he's seeking unspecified damages for breach of contract and other claims, and Netflix has not publicly addressed this suit, a Bloomberg reporter did obtain a statement from one executive given to staffers, which said, the unprecedented scale created many technical challenges, which the launch team tackled brilliantly by prioritizing stability of the stream for the majority of viewers. But adding, we don't want to dismiss the poor experience of some members and know we have room for improvement, but still consider this event a huge success. And so one, we'll have to wait to see if anything comes from this class action lawsuit, but then also two, we'll have to wait to see what happens with Netflix streaming in general and if trust can kind of be gained. Because right, one of the next big things is that Netflix is streaming NFL games on Christmas, which is gonna have a huge number of NFL fans wanting to watch the games, but then also there's gonna be people tuning in because Beyonce's doing a halftime show. And then let's talk about why you have people praising and freaking out over a Bible-infused curriculum in public schools. Right, and that because among the big things that we're seeing is that the Texas State Board of education just threw their support behind a new Bible-infused elementary school curriculum. And while it was only a preliminary vote with a real one scheduled for Friday, eight of the 15 state school board members gave it a thumbs up, which means that the Blue Bonnet learning curriculum will stay on the list of approved curricula for K through five reading and language arts materials in 2025. And for those wondering, you know, what is a Bible-infused curriculum? Uh, I'll give you a few examples of what we're seeing, right? One example is this kindergarten lesson on the golden rule, reportedly introducing kids to Jesus and his sermon on the Mount in the New Testament. Then another kindergarten unit about art appreciation would focus 
focus primarily on the book of Genesis and the art inspired by it. Then in a fifth grade lesson about Juneteenth, kids compare the book of Daniel to Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham jail. And then a lesson about Da Vinci's The Last Supper reportedly includes several verses from the book of Matthew and an account of the last meal the 12 disciples had with Jesus. Now I will say it is an important thing to note that this curriculum is not mandatory, it's technically optional, but also because Blue Bonnet Learning was developed by the Texas Education Agency, the state school districts would get extra funding if they choose to adopt it. With reports saying that schools could get as much as $40 extra per student. And so when you're talking about 2.3 million K through five public school students in Texas, that adds up fast. And as you can imagine, and you may be one of them, there have been a lot of people having strong reactions to this news. In fact, when the Board of Education met on Monday, there were reportedly over a hundred people offering seven hours worth of public comments before they had to adjourn until Tuesday. And in the hell no camp, you had many parents, even Christians, arguing that it was their right to choose how their kids learn about religion, not the states. There were also other Texans who aren't Christians saying that the lessons on the Blue Bonnet curriculum are inappropriate for a classroom and completely lack balance. Like for example, one Jewish grandmother from San Antonio saying, I believe my grandkids should share our family's religion. I need help stopping the government from teaching them to be Christians. Which was also a sentiment echoed by the Texas AFT, right? A large teacher union, which said that the Blue Bonnet curriculum's quote, extensive lopsided coverage of Christianity and the Bible suggests that it is the only religious tradition of any importance. And adding, that is not a message that Texas public schools, which are called to serve a religiously diverse population, have any business conveying. And then there were also those who took issue with the quality of the lessons, both from a religious and educational perspective. Like for example, with Amanda Tyler, the executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty, who said that the curriculum is quote, neither instructionally sound nor factually accurate and would be misleading for young kids. With then the Texas Freedom Network, a watchdog monitoring the state education board saying that the curriculum spends too much time on Christianity and dances around the history of slavery. With one educator adding there, this curriculum fails to meet the standard of an honest secular one. Public schools are meant to educate, not indoctrinate. And all of that is without mentioning the people that have concerns about the establishment clause in the US constitution, AKA the separation of church and state. But then also with this, obviously there were those who were all for blue bonnet learning to be adopted in schools. With this side making the argument that including Bible passages will enhance cultural literacy and students understanding of American values. You had Texas Governor Greg Abbott calling these lessons high quality instructional materials that will quote, allow our students to better understand the connection of history, art, community, literature, and religion on pivotal events like the signing of the US Constitution, the Civil Rights Movement, and the American Revolution. And in response to the complaints regarding lack of religious balance in the curriculum, Jonathan Covey, the director of policy for Texas Values said, it has always been understood that religion has a place in American civic society. And adding, there's no rule that says, if you have 25 references to the Bible, you must have 25 references to every other religion. But for now, one, we'll have to see what the final official vote is on Friday, and two, I gotta ask, what are your thoughts here? But then we got hate crimes at a Panera Bread in the news today, right? And you might be slightly familiar because there's been this video circulating online the past couple of days. And so apparently the story here is that this lady was in a Panera when she saw what seems Iran wearing a hoodie that said Palestine on the back. She, I guess, took that very personally because she then confronts him, asks if he's Palestinian and starts swearing at him, hitting him and swinging at his pregnant wife. With Wasim later saying in an interview that she was just spewing hate at them. Went to my face and said, are you Palestinian, which I said yes. And then she said, F you, F Palestine. Um, this is, Palestine is my land, it's not your land. Um, you can't wear that in America. Uh, you guys don't belong in America. And according to Asim, the lady then followed them across the restaurant when they tried to walk away and continued assaulting them. And reportedly it wasn't until Wasim told her that if she kept it up, he was gonna punch her. And then she took a step back and things chilled out. With Wasim later saying to Fox News 32, I did everything I could to not touch her because I knew as soon as I did anything, the roles would be reversed. It would be she's the victim and the strong, brown, handsome man attacked like a young, poor lady. And I didn't want the story to be reversed. And she gets away with what she did. Now with the situation, one of the questions that's popped up is, why did no one intervene, right, while this lady was just straight up attacking these people? And well, there, Wasim said. I mean, as a Palestinian American, I'm used to verbal hate. Um, you hear insults thrown at you whenever I wear a Palestinian hoodie or a kofiya or even my wife wearing a hijab. Um, it, hate is very common in our community, but having physical hate after being over a minute long and still no one coming to help us it's kind of shocking, honestly. But then also, according to Asim, they've gotten even more harassment since this has gone viral. With him claiming that he's gotten a bunch of hateful messages and him saying, I received death threats saying how like, I hope your baby dies and I hope your wife gets deported when Trump is back. And honestly just shows how our society is right now. Also, as far as the lady that attacked them, she has been arrested and she's facing two counts of hate crime and one count of misdemeanor disorderly conduct. With the local authorities saying this type of behavior is not and will never be tolerated in our community. And adding, every member of society, regardless 
of race, religion, sexual orientation, or any other individual characteristic deserves to be treated with respect and civility. But then taking a quick break from the news, you know, isn't it wild how easy it is to sign up for subscriptions, but then you want to cancel and it's a nightmare? Now, don't get me wrong. Like, I love a good subscription, anything that simplifies life, but sometimes it's time to cut ties. And so actually, thanks to our sponsor, Rocket Money, they not only handle the cancellation process for me, they actually have my back across the board. And that's because Rocket Money is a personal finance app that helps find and cancel your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so you can grow your savings. Are you done with a subscription? Rocket Money can help you cancel them with a few taps. And it also does more than just manage subscriptions, right? You can track spending, set budgets, and get alerts for price hikes or unusual spending. And their goals feature helps you save for things like paying off credit cards or just building your savings. Also, I love that they negotiate lower bills on your behalf, sometimes saving up to 20%. You just submit a picture of your bill and they'll take care of the rest. And Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all the app's features. So stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash PDS. That's rocketmoney.com slash PDS, rocketmoney.com slash PDS. But then you may have heard that the air pollution in India, specifically the city of Delhi is bad. And right now, if you take a look, toxic smog has absolutely covered the place. But those things do not get across how bad bad it truly is right now. We're talking about record-breaking pollution with levels hitting 50 times the safe limit in some parts of the city. On Monday, for example, the Swiss company IQ Air said the city's overall air quality index exceeded 1,600. The scale that's on, less than 50 is considered good and anything above 301 is considered hazardous, potentially leading to severe eye and throat irritation and serious heart and lung conditions. The American EPA basically considers anything above 500 to be off the chart, with one Indian politician pointing out that Delhi's not just the most polluted city in the world. It's nearly five times as bad as the second most polluted city, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Now you have doctors saying just existing in this city is like smoking 50 cigarettes a day, which one, just on its own is horrifying, and two, imagine getting lung cancer but not in the pursuit of a dope-ass leather Marlboro jacket. Also, for the Gen Zers or the millennials who didn't have smoker parents that do not understand that reference, there used to be reward programs for people that bought cigarettes. But I digress, the, the situation in Delhi has gotten so bad, the authorities have shut down schools, halted construction work, they banned non-essential trucks from entering the city. And then in addition to that, they've just encouraged people to stay inside. But of course, one, some people can't, and two, even if they can, it may not help that much. Because reportedly, a lot of people can't afford air filters and many homes offer little protection from this level of smog. Which, you know, as we often see, shows how this ties into another big issue that's facing much of the world, but especially India, which is massive inequality. Right, and to that point, we've seen examples like a 70-year-old man who makes his living selling books at a roadside stall, telling the Guardian, I can feel burning sensations in my eyes, lungs, and belly. I know this toxic air is killing my lungs further, but I cannot stay home. My earnings are hand to mouth and at it. It is a fight to stay alive no matter how little you can. People have to breathe even if they know here in Delhi they are breathing poison. You know, with that, it's important to note, it's not just Delhi right now. Right, one, other parts of India and also Pakistan have been massively affected, and two, pollution is an all year problem. With one of the reasons for that being that India generates well over half of its electricity from coal. And then in big cities like Delhi, all that pollution is combined with emissions from millions and millions of cars and poorly regulated industry. Plus, in winter, it gets even worse because of a phenomenon known as thermal inversion, which is what's happening right now. Right, Basically, the colder, heavier winter air traps pollutants close to the ground, worsening the smog. And that's without mentioning, this is also the time of year thousands of farmers burn off agricultural waste after the harvest season, with one estimate even suggesting that these fires have contributed to as much as 40% of the pollution in Delhi. Which is why with all that, there's a lot of people calling for major changes. Last month, for example, we saw India's top court ruling that clean air was a fundamental human right, slamming the government for inaction and ordering national and state level authorities to do more. But also, notably there, the court has been taking action on this issue for decades. We're still where we are today. So we're gonna have to wait to see if anything actually changes. And if so, how long it's gonna take. But then, Israel is now offering a $5 million award plus more for each hostage release from Gaza. With Netanyahu announcing this in a video shot in central Gaza, saying, whoever dares to harm our hostages will pay the price, we will pursue you and we will find you. But then adding, whoever brings us a hostage will find a safe way out for himself and his family, and adding, we will also give $5 million for every hostage. And this has been received as very big and pretty controversial news. With, for example, the mother of one of the hostages still in Gaza telling CNN, the prime minister is trading the hostages' lives. And adding, it's unbelievable 
inconceivable that the man who funded Hamas is once again offering money to Hamas. Right in there, what she's talking about is a controversial Israeli bag deal in which millions of dollars were sent to Hamas to keep Palestinians divided. But in any case, right, what we may be seeing here is just Bibi's latest attempt to deal with mounting criticism from his own people. Because you see, many Israelis, including the families of hostages, have accused him of prolonging this war. With, for example, one instance being back in August when Netanyahu set out brand new conditions for a ceasefire, like insisting that Israel maintain control of a strip of Gaza along the Egyptian border. And as far as why he would prolong the war, you have critics saying it's to just hang on to power. Because very notably, there are members of his own governing coalition who have threatened to abandon Netanyahu if he agrees to a ceasefire. And also with that, you have critics saying that his far-right allies may be able to help him beat the corruption charges that he's also facing. And in fact there, last year, they helped pass a law blocking the ability of the country's judiciary to declare the prime minister unfit for office, which many have claimed was a way to protect Netanyahu. And there, right, because if you've forgotten, Netanyahu is battling charges of bribery, fraud, and breach of trust based on allegations that he granted political favors to wealthy businessmen in exchange for gifts and sympathetic media coverage. With just last week, an Israeli court rejecting his request to have his testimony delayed, so he's actually expected to take the stand on December 2nd. Though, I will say there that he's reportedly still trying to wriggle his way out of that, with an Israeli newspaper reporting that he's asked the Internal Security Service to provide an opinion claiming that he'd be in danger if he testified. While they denied that specific request, we'll have to wait to see if he tries something else. But then also, with all that, it's not the only scandal rocking the Israeli government right now. Because while Netanyahu's case goes back years, there's a new case involving the alleged efforts of several Israeli officials and military officers to illegally influence public opinion in the PM's favor. With that apparently including by leaking classified military documents, altering official transcripts of his conversations, and intimidating people who controlled access to those records. Though again, with all that, Netanyahu is still insisting that he won't stop until Hamas no longer rules Gaza, and saying that Israel was making progress towards this goal. But this also, as the Israeli military has repeatedly returned to areas of Gaza that it previously said had been clear. Like for example, earlier this week, a single airstrike on a residential block in northern Gaza reportedly killed at least 34 people. And today, strikes throughout the territory have killed at least 33 people, with dozens more being wounded, and this including in designated humanitarian zones, schools, and a hospital. And all of this is the UN also warning that virtually no aid has reached northern Gaza in 40 days, and with that, already overwhelmed medical facilities are reportedly seeing more and more children showing up, showing signs of malnutrition. Although it's also just not bad news in the north. Right in the southern half of Gaza, officials say looting by criminal groups unaffiliated with Hamas may now be the biggest obstacle to the distribution of aid. And in the latest major incident, 98 of the 109 trucks carrying food aid from one southern crossing were ransacked by armed men overnight. And very notably, the problem has reportedly gotten even worse since Israel began targeting civilian police officers who had been guarding humanitarian convoys, with Israel citing their affiliation with the Hamas-run government. Also, very notable here, according to a UN memo obtained by the Washington Post, these gangs, quote, may be benefiting from a passive, if not active, benevolence or protection from the Israeli military, with then aid organizations further claiming that Israeli authorities have denied most of their requests for better measures to safeguard convoys. Also saying Israeli forces within the view of the attacks have failed on multiple occasions to intervene. You know, all of this after last week where a UN special committee determined Israel's warfare methods in Gaza are consistent with genocide, including use of starvation as a weapon of war. Though, of course, with that, the Israeli military has denied the allegations. Also with this, I would note that all of that is just with Gaza, right? We also have to keep an eye on Lebanon, right? And that because Lebanese and Hezbollah officials have reportedly agreed to a U.S. ceasefire proposal. And so now a U.S. envoy is in Israel pushing for it. But on both fronts, right now, we're gonna have to wait to see what happens next. But that, my friends, you beautiful bastards, is the end of your Wednesday evening, Thursday morning dive into the news. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you right back here tomorrow.